There are many adjectives one could use to describe these small rocks, but ordinary is not one of them. Though experienced reef divers may disagree, to the ham radio world the words dangerous, extreme, or even ridiculous are all better suited. With its questionable entry into the DXCC program, absurdly small operating area, and famously feuding parents, no single entity in our list has ever achieved such a dubious yet coveted reputation. But what is it that makes this place so controversial and so attractive at the same time? And what is it that stirs up the passions and DXers everywhere at the mere hint of an expedition? This is the story of a very small place at the top of the DXCC list. How it got there and why this time it all worked. Aberdeen Harbor, Hong Kong, Monday, April 23rd, 2007. It's exactly two days before scheduled sailing time. After years of rumors, false starts, uncertainty, and endless negotiations, all that remains now is for these last few crates of cargo to be loaded on board. The expeditions to the world's rarest locations often face steep challenges, be they financial, environmental, or diplomatic. But with its turbulent history as a disputed territory, and such a small area on which to build a station, Scarborough Reef is in a class all by itself, having remained at or near number one for so long. For more than a century, the reefs and islands inside the South China Sea have been locked in a complicated tangle of disputed ownership, allowing piracy to flourish and a general state of uncertainty to prevail. It's a zone of both lawlessness and military tension, and with the rumor of vast oil deposits under its seabed, the tension is higher today than it's ever been. Even the slightest move can be seen as either confirming or conceding a claim. Thus, obtaining official civilian permission to visit any of these islands can often be a complicated and frustrating diplomatic dance. Though the facts involved with Scarborough Reef differ somewhat from other islands in the region, notably the Spratleys, staging a de-expedition there requires delicate navigation between two opposing players, China and the Philippines. On this trip, however, international diplomacy was only part of the problem. Competing rivalries from other DX groups and differences of opinion between the team organizers on how to deal with each nation brought this trip close to cancellation on numerous occasions. Usually in expedition you have problems getting a boat. Usually in an expedition you have problems raising money. We had none of these issues. For two years we fought the political problems of putting this on the air. Remember that 10 years earlier, at gunpoint, the last operation was kicked off after 36 hours on the air and 10 or 12,000 cues. Nobody wanted to go back, especially those who'd already been there, W6RGG and others, to turn around and leave again a short time later and, and again leave a lot of DXers waiting at home looking for a cue that they never made. Mindful of the extreme sensitivities about Scarborough in both Beijing and Manila, the team's organizers moved cautiously, avoiding high-profile publicity as much as possible. I put up a website. I started putting team members on the website. We put call letters. We put flags. We get a call from Asia. You can't do that. Take the flags off the website. We take them off. Other people were watching. They wanted the flags back on the website. We were called in the middle of the night. I'll never forget this. It was like three in the morning. Frantic phone call. We had the Chinese name 
for a Scarborough Reef on the website. It had to come off. We took it off. Then we got a call. It had to go back on. We had Chinese letters on the website. It had to come off. It had to go back on. The website wasn't even public yet. And people continued to call. You can't do this. You can't do that. We had governments watching. People in China were looking. People in the Philippines were looking. Even though the DX community had no idea this expedition was two months from happening, you would be amazed at how many people were watching this website. In line with publicly stated policy on the reef sovereignty, Beijing repeatedly insisted that no official Philippine endorsement was needed to operate from the reef. And 10 years after the premature exit of the last DX expedition, all issues were now settled at a high government level. But the news coming from sources in Manila was quite different, and up until one week before departure, there were still no signs that the Philippine military had given a blessing to this latest de expedition. Desperate to avoid a repeat disaster, the team enlisted the skillful help of the Philippine Amateur Radio Association, who quietly arranged for their Coast Guard to keep a distant but watchful eye over the team for the entire trip, should any emergencies arise. We discussed about the help we were giving should not be visible, and in case an emergency arises, we have to be ready for that. But to make sure that anything that is beyond the 12-mile limit will not enter, uh, I mean, pirate or whatever boat that uh, the Philippine Navy knows kind of will not get into that area. In exchange for this assistance, and in a respectful nod at the unsettled political situation, the Philippine Coast Guard requested that no flags from any nation be hoisted on the rocks or the ship. Though it was somewhat of a gamble to make these backdoor negotiations, sometimes that is the best option in Asia, where official government position and public face are so important. Uh, coming up on 0600, so this begins our third day at sea. A wonderful time it's been, uh, a little bouncy as you've just heard. Uh, also filled with a little excitement. Yesterday we uh, wandered into some charted waters that we were not supposed to be in and got approached by a Chinese boat and was promptly yelled at for 30 minutes. Got ran out of Dodge really quick, had to follow them out. The tough wooden hold ship used for this de expedition is named Deep Blue and can sleep up to 20 passengers and six crew. A converted fishing vessel that today is mostly used for diving excursions in and around the reefs of the South China Sea. Though it will take almost four days of sailing out of Hong Kong to reach Scarborough Reef, the real journey has taken almost 14 years. Well, Scarborough Reef actually has quite interesting history, both as, uh, as an entity from a political point of view, but uh, even more so in, uh, on a DXCC basis. Actually, Scarborough Reef was discovered by German ham called BK9KX. I think it was the year 1993. I was uh, then uh, in Asia. I was based in Hong Kong, and I was traveling a lot to uh, Philippines. And uh, I got interested because uh, there's absolutely no indication on uh, many of the maps that there are such an island. And uh, uh, I flew then over to Scarborough and uh, I saw just a few pieces of rocks and I kind of said that this, this can never be another DXCC entity and as a result of this uh, survey flight the Germans actually cancelled the expedition. It was kind of burning in my mind at that time because there was no real criteria on the DXCC what size of the country would qualify and knowing the uh, rocks belong to uh, China kind of gave us basis to proceed. We decided to leave during typhoon season, which was not a very good idea. That's why we ended up choosing the now infamous scaffold. We set that up, got on the air, SSB only on 20 meters, made as many contacts as we could in about 14 hours, tore everything down and headed back to a safe land. I think we made some four 
5,000 QSOs at that time. Horrible experience. We were all seasick all the way through, and everybody said that we would never come back. The result uh, immediately, you know, before we got home, all these references to Scaffold Reef and Okino Torishima, the kind of infamous place that was once on the DXCC list. We talked a lot about the criteria for being a land-based operation, which is one of the DXCC rules. Bill Kenimer at the ARRL was insistent that if we operated there, we needed to build a platform that was entirely on the rocks. They were very controversial inputs coming from the DXAC. That was then the first challenge really to see that the decision will be made very much on the emotional basis. It was amazing in those days I would get faxes, I would get phone calls, I had messages left on my answering machine, I mean some very nasty, I mean just threatening messages from people who were just adamantly opposed to Scarborough being added to the list. I really was not prepared for the kind of visceral response just raising the subject of Scarborough Reef. There were a number of DX Advisory Committee members who flat out said, even if it technically meets the rules, I can't vote for this in good conscience because it's just a silly thing. A bunch of rocks shouldn't be a country. So on the first review, DXAC considered that uh, it wasn't land-based operation, so it cannot really be qualified. So we decided that let's go back, put it on the dry land, and we obtained exact uh, instructions from ARRL. Nobody really wasn't uh, aware of how to build a plat platform in the middle of the ocean, so it was kind of funny looking thing. I think we made another four or five thousand QSOs. We really didn't go there to satisfy the DX uh, audience as such. We just went there to prove that the land-based operation can be done. I always re remember one comment from one of the DXAC members he, when he was really unhappy about what we were doing, so he said that it seems that anything where OH2BAs can sleep overnight would seemingly count for the XCC. That I, I kept in my mind, and there was a one night on that second operation that I, I slept uh, overnight. My son was operating, and that was one of those memorable nights. he never forget that. So anyway, we went back, completely satisfied. We did land-based operation, and we thought that this would count. Interestingly enough, there was a vote and it was voted down on the basis that the island is too small. So first, the scat fall, we were able to wor work out to be land-based, and then when we did, so then the island suddenly began to be too, uh, too small. And in the DXCC criteria at that time, there was nothing about the size of the island. So based on uh, all the different considerations, we, we then decided to take another approach. So I was talking to a Chinese radio sport people, Shen Ping was uh, at that time the general secretary of the association and uh, they were as, as much uh, disappointed as uh, we were because this was the first ever DXCC initiative out of uh, a People's Republic of China. There was a letter then sent from China to uh, ARRL uh, asking the reason for, for, for the process and for the cancellation of the initiative. And then ARR saw that this is actually a little bigger thing than uh, just uh, looking at the DXCC criteria and operation as such. And uh, the case was elevated to uh, ARR board level and the vote was uh, all in favor. I, I saw something, I saw something there, definitely, in uh, 11 o'clock. I don't see anything. I think these guys are imagining this reef. The first signs of Scarborough Reef come into view at around sunset on the 29th of April. From this point, it will take at least one more full day to enter the reef, find the exposed rocks at high tide, and get a station on the air. Located on the eastern side of the South China Sea, about 200 kilometers west of the Philippine coastline, Scarborough Reef is a classic example of a sunken volcanic atoll. The triangular-shaped reef measures only 19 kilometers across, 
and encircles a shallow saltwater lagoon with the interior dipping only 20 meters at its deepest point. The lagoon itself has only one navigable entrance, a narrow underwater cut at the southeastern tip. Because this is a ship's first visit to the reef and the entrance coordinates are not accurately marked on all charts, a small scouting boat with a depth sounder is sent ahead to guide Deep Blue safely across the coral heads. Once clear of the entrance, the ship will position itself at a deeper location a few kilometers inside and drop anchor not far from the reef's highest and most exposed rocks. At first glance, these bare rocks look much too small to support equipment, antennas, and a generator, let alone one or two operators. That one is much better because two sides. Two sides separated, yeah. Separated. It is precisely this barren rock image that caused many in the DX world to question the very legitimacy of Scarborough Reef. <laughs> Indeed, there are still those who believe that any island capable of being surveyed with a tape measure is just too small to be counted. Four large rocks near the southern edge of the reef are eventually chosen for this operation, three of which were used by the previous D expedition and documented using precise GPS coordinates. Separated by several hundred meters and all within a few minutes access by boat, the distance between each should be adequate to set up four stations without too much interference. A land-based operation as outlined by the DXCC rules means that each station must be above the high tide mark and physically attached to dry land, not on a scaffold. This means that the platforms have to be tailored to each rock's unique shape, which is an extremely difficult task when working out in the open sea. But size seems to be no object for this team, and the brilliant engineering skill of Co. BV6HJ is called into action. Together with his designer back in Taiwan, BV4DP, and using the rock dimensions documented from the three previous expeditions, these two worked out an ingenious method for quickly erecting stable platforms using only a basic set of wooden building materials. Aside from the political issues of ownership, construction such as this is at the root of the Scarborough controversy. Many say that because platforms are needed, Scarborough should have never been considered as a DXCC entity in the first place, and the rules were stretched beyond the reasonable limits of what defines land or a land-based operation. The other side argues that there was never a minimum size rule when the Scarborough question initially came up, and just like other questionable entities that made it to the DXCC list in their day, such as 1A0 or 4U1, Scarborough should remain. Anticipating a tough situation in the field, with limited resources to fix any problems, all of the stations and their antennas were assembled, tested and burned in at least one month prior to departure. The plan is for rocks 1, 2, and 4 to each use a stepper vertical. Rock number 3 will use a tri-band Yagi, similar to a Force 12 C4. Because Scarborough is at the very top of the wanted list, two of the four rocks will stay on 20 meters phone and code 24 hours a day, while the rest will alternate between the other bands following propagation. For the next week, a multinational team of 16 operators will rotate three times a day through these rocks.
So now the expedition finally arrives at the rocks. Platforms are built, the stations are on the air, and panic sets in. In all of the expeditions I've been involved in, I've just never seen from day one the panic. Where are they? Why aren't they working me? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they there? Tom Harrell and I were getting email after email of, they've been on the air for 12 hours, they're not in my log. Is it the panic because the last expedition got cut short because of political things? I mean, we couldn't figure it out. But there was a panic over BS7H from the first CUSO to the last CUSO. It was just amazing. They arrived at these tiny little rocks. They put one station on the air at a time and people expected it to be like the mega expedition where 15 stations show up at once on seven bands. Well, that couldn't happen. I mean, we had vertical antennas out there. We had stations still being built and it was amazing to watch the packet cluster comments, the hate email. I mean, it was just, it was mind boggling. Like most other islands in the South China Sea, Scarborough Reef is embroiled in an international dispute. But unlike the neighboring Spratly Islands to the south, the Philippines makes no sovereignty claim to the reef. In fact, the official borders of the Republic clearly fall outside of Scarborough, as can be seen on any maritime chart of the Philippine Islands. The problem arises over economic rights to exploitation and the so-called United Nations Law of the Sea. The Philippines, which refers to the area as Scarborough Shoal, regards the mostly submerged reef as previously unclaimed, so its 200-mile Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, encompasses the area by default. China, on the other hand, calls the reef Huangyang Dao, or Yellow Rock Island, and says it holds historical evidence the reef was used by fishermen dating back to the Ming Dynasty, almost 700 years ago. That, combined with the fact that several rocks extend above the high tide mark, has allowed China to claim its own 200-mile economic zone. Long-running disputes over the other islands, like the Spratlys, have meant that China and the Philippines have never formally negotiated their overlapping claims at Scarborough, or brought their cases to an international body for arbitration. As a result, ships from several countries actively exploit the reef for its natural resources though the Philippine Navy routinely ejects Chinese vessels if suspected of piracy or illegal fishing. Scarborough also appears in the Philippine press on a regular basis, especially during elections, when enthusiastic senators like to stir up nationalistic claims outside of official government policy. Such was the case shortly after the 1997 de-expedition team made international headlines with their eviction and a group of senators decided Scarborough would make a nice photo opportunity. Bravo Alpha, something again? Germany, Papa, America, 59. Uh, this is Japan, Alpha, 9. Germany, Papa, America, Yesterday, we set up a uh, uh, station on the Rock, rock 3 uh, here. Uh, we set up a Yagi antenna about uh, 
nine meters above the sea level. So it it works uh, very well on the uh, 50 meter and 10 meters. Uh, I'm very, I'm so exciting, uh, and uh, I hope I can give I can make more QSOs. Let everyone happy. November unite Mike again. Mike, uh, Germany, Germany uniform. November uniform Mike again. Japan Alpha 7 November United Mike. JJA 7 November uniform Mike 69. Japan Alpha 7 November Unified Mike 69. Uh, Jimmy, America 7, Germany, Germany Uniform, 5 by 9, over. Zai 每个人的声音都是非常的焦急因为黄燕岛是第一这个字头那我们在这里能够满足世界很多业务性的爱好者的需求我们也感到非常的高兴那我在这里呢也觉得收获很多与我们这个美国的这个组织的team Unforgotten memory for me. Uh, Hello, Mike. Well, we try to do the morning shift about an hour after sunrise, which is great because that's usually the highest tide. It's easy for the boats to get out and uh, and make the shift change, and we resupply, take fuel. The lunchtime shift change is when I go out and collect the logs for um, the daily log collection and, and collation. And then the interesting shift change occurs uh, later in the day toward sunset because the tide, uh, the tide is low at that point. It seems to be getting lower every day also. Walk. Yeah. Okay guys, you're gonna walk. It's not easy to go to the, to the rocks because on low tide, uh, the boat cannot make the whole way through, so uh, every time we have to get up early from the boat and walk through the water to come to the rocks. So this takes quite a long time. The problem is if you walk over the corals, some corals are very, very soft and you sink uh, deep if you're not careful. And I had, I have a cut on my legs because I was sinking one feet deep into the corals and sometimes quite sharp. I stay here on this small island and it's very nice. You feel very good if you have solid ground under your legs. And, but it will only last a few hours because when the high tide is coming, everything is washed. I rode out to, uh, to do some kind of computing work on one of the rocks. And we ran aground six or seven times and uh, just not able to make any progress. So the four of us who weren't going to the rock got off the boat and stood in the coral. And of course the coral's dead and it, it uh, compresses heavily under your feet. So I tried not to lose my balance, but uh, got hit by a wave and a, and a wind gust and went over onto my, uh, my behind into the coral. A lot of times we're having to calculate when low tide and high tide is, and sometimes that's only a difference of six to eight inches in the tide, and it makes a difference of whether or not you can actually even be in the boat to get stuff out there. It's uh, a big logistics problem trying to get uh, 
three or four rocks up and they're spread, you know, almost a mile apart from end to end and operators from the boat and trying to get everybody here right at sun up so we can meet all the, the gray line expectations and then as well as uh, sundown so that everybody gets in and secured for the night. sink over there. Marty had to, to walk through the coral barrier to come on the rock, but everything is broken over there, so you cannot walk because you go down in the coral. So Marty gave up. Very disappointing. It was my duty to go on the, on the reef, and uh, there was just no not much water, so I wanted to walk, but they are so soft that I just fell down three feet at once, and then they seemingly saw some empty spots. Uh, so that you can go down, uh, down uh, all, all the way. So I, I got scared. They wanted to carry me through, but you know, I, I weighed a little bit. And then Max was brave enough to come back, but uh, now we see how, how he uh, suffered. This is not a little bit pain. <laughs> yeah. It's good for you. Quite a new experience. I, didn't, I, I thought it was a solid rock, just walk in there, but it was <laughs> amazing, amazing experience. W6, Hotel Expert Whiskey, 5-9. Yeah, also 5-9, thank you for hearing my signal. Thank you, QR, Bravo, Sugar 7 Hotel, North America only. Uh, November, uh, November something, 5 Tango again. Uh, Nancy, Quebec, five tango, KSL. KSL, November Queen, five tango. Uh, this is Bravo Sugar Seven Hotel. Up. Uh, November Radio Seven Delta X Ray, five nine. Thank you, QRZ, Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel, 230. Uh, W0 Whiskey Papa, 59. Yes, uh, Whiskey 0 Whiskey Papa, 5973. Uh, something 2 Radio, something 2 Radio again. Alpha Charlie 2 Radio, KSL. Roger, 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 QSL. Okay, Alpha Charlie 2 Radio, you are 59773. So, 820 Thursday morning. Not only do we get to pull uh, operator shift duty, but everybody's had breakfast and uh, after a shift change this morning, it's time that we pull our maintenance duties. We've got a generator that's uh, not functioning properly, making some noises, so we've exited the station to shut down. We're going to take out uh, spark plugs and uh, oil, take a look at it, and see if we can't fix it here. Stop, stop, sorry. First it was making uh, noises like it was seizing, and now it's fine. So we got a dead handheld, and we really don't know what's going on out there. Sitting back there, we couldn't figure out what you were getting at. Yeah, I need to get up there now. Okay. What I'm doing is just doing an oil check and there's plenty in there. You notice it's running out the side. And uh, we have a drip tray here so we won't pollute the South China Sea. Just checking to see if we have good compression. I think this generator is fine. A little bit of water in the fuel, but that never hurt anything. Water. That's why you run uh, gasoline on expeditions and not diesel. As soon as you get a drop of water in diesel fuel, it kills the generator. Uh, I'm probably, yeah, maybe. I want to take a look at the PC real fast. There you go, that's what it 
Well, what I'm doing, I'm booting up this uh, little old laptop. Just going to do a quick check of our uh, date no, no, time. Thing. Dates right. 12.31 a.m. Okay, I think we're okay. And now I'm booting up CT. We'll check how many cues we have here. Okay, so we have 1,893 cues. And now Joe's ready to go. That is awfully close. I'm glad I shaved last night. <laughs> I'm glad you so, brushed your teeth. Oh, I wish that. Check had. out this <laughs> sun visor on Joe's glasses. Yeah, there you go. It's my sun See, visor. now the real de expeditioners can be ingenious and devise these kind of systems for, for every so, issue. If I'd had the handheld, do you suppose we could have solved this problem with just me on the handheld? Yeah. Do you yes. think so? Yeah. Do you think someone would have said that? Yeah. Okay, great. We would have figured it out eventually. Yeah. I, I, I think you can run the handheld while it's in the charger. You, I tried that. It's, it's just not enough juice. With the handheld was cutting out. I don't know if the charger's bad, the battery went bad, but since we swapped it out, you should be okay now. The dead one's in the boat already. Yeah, we have two here. Yeah. I wanted to have one on the boat and take the dead one back and have you a good one. Yeah, that's a real de-expedition. The <laughs> well, that's why the rest of us are here. That's right. Took, took four friggin' engineers to come out here and figure we had a dead battery. Change the AAA battery. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes on the South China Sea. That's a serious problem. <laughs> We're good. Sweet. Rock on, man. Seventeen meters here, been working pretty good. The signals are a little weaker. I guess not as many people have the directional antennas. Uh, fighting a little bit of uh, tiresome with your leg on the foot switch and then switching back to Vox and of course we've got uh, winds here on the reef and trying to keep the sun off our legs and our faces and keep from getting sunburnt. Uh, it's tiring, it's exhilarating, uh, but having a lot of fun at this point. So looking forward to doing a couple of more shifts, working a lot of the guys back home. Work stateside uh, this morning, so very happy. Very good propagation. Japan Hotel One, Mike X-Ray, Victor 5-9. Okay, did you lead off on one, Charlie? Uh, give it to me again. Did you lead off on one, Charlie? There's been uh, lots of concerns about security issues, trying to get folks on and off the reef. There's been uh, lots of times when we have low tide and people have actually had to get out of the boat and walk in the reef and the, the coral crunch beneath your feet. Several of us have got uh, pretty well beaten up ankles, trying to get to and from the operating positions, get everything set up. Uh, and make sure everybody's got their rations for gasoline and fuel, food and fuel, you know, everything. So it's uh, it's been some trying times. One Mike Romeo, Germany. Uh, Delta United One, Kilowatt Tango. I had two different stations there. Sorry, go. Okay, thank you. You're 59 in Manila for B1 Kilo Tango. Moving signal, thank you. Thank you, DU1KT59. Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel, listening 150 and up. You lead off of one Queen Ocean, Charlie, 5-9. It uh, gets pretty hairy out here at night with some of the waves crashing up over the, the bulkhead, if you hear, if you will, and equipment getting wet. And uh, it's, it's a little scary, it's a little exhilarating, uh, and it's a whole lot of fun. Okay, Julia Alpha 2, Foxtrot. Foxtrot to Bravo, Charlie. Fox to Bravo, Charlie, 5-9. QSL, Juliet Alpha 2, Foxtrot, Bravo, Charlie. You're also 5-9. QRZ, Bravo, Sugar, 7 Hotel, 150 and up. And for those of you that uh, are questioning why we're on what bands, what we're doing, what we're doing, how we're doing it, okay, the, um, back. the overriding principle for this, uh, all of us agreed, is safety. Uh, Everybody's so safety. Alpha, With the tide, the boat, everything, safety has to come first. And being on this side of the pileup, in the middle of nowhere, where you can't even walk to safety, um, it, it's really a huge challenge. Okay, the four papa again. Uh, Juliet Echo 2, Foxtrot Uniform, Papa, you're 5 and 9. We hope that everyone understands that this is a huge logistical nightmare uh, to try to put this on the air. Four different stations. It takes hours and hours a day just to change operators. We spend the bulk of our day just shuffling people so that we have properly manned stations in all the openings. Uh, Delta Sierra Yankee, 5-9. Uh, if there's criticisms, the only thing I can say Get your finances together and come out here. It's a very humbling experience. QSL, Juliet Alpha 3, Delta Sierra Yankee 59, QRZ, Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel 150 and up.
Dipping beneath the waterline at Scarborough reveals a fascinating and sad tale of destruction. A dwindling stock of fish, dead or dying coral, and a seabed littered with unexploded missiles. Whether the reef's demise is due to pollution, cyanide and dynamite fishing, or just a general rise in global sea temperatures is still a mystery. The source of the unexploded ordnance, however, is well known. Throughout the Vietnam War, the U.S. military routinely used this reef as target practice out of the former Clark Air Base in the Philippines. As a result, many of these weapons still present a serious danger to local fishermen, especially if the highly destructive dynamite technique is used. Rumors also circulated that the U.S. Navy used Scarborough's exposed rocks for target practice as recently as 1990 just prior to the first Gulf War. Today was interesting. Uh, this morning, mid-morning, simultaneously, we got a call from W6RGG on one of the rocks and uh, OH2BH on the westernmost rock, uh, saying they had some visitors, some of the Filipino fishermen. They decided to board Marty's rock and then their, their outrigger skiff. The skipper and James and, and several others came over in the speedboat. The Marty was his usual diplomatic self. They were very anxious to see what's happening. This, uh, they were more interested probably on a computer than on the radio, right? Yeah. So where are you from actually? What city in the in, uh, Philippines? Sambales. Sambales? Only Iba. 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 Iba, I see. I, see. Very good. I just didn't. So rarely when we get visitors here these, these days, so I didn't actually know how to serve them or how to make friends, but I think they're very friendly people. I like them like them a lot. They give me a little company too. Well, actually, I think they're just fishing and they got anxious uh, what's happening. You know, it's kind of strange for fishermen to see that there is people transmitting on each and every rock. So I, I, if I would be fisherman, I would come here every day. And uh, I think these people are very friendly. They just uh, wanted to see what we are, what we are doing. I, I thought that they were actually more interested on the computer than uh, on the radio. But what the heck, uh, that's, that's fine. I will go back to do some more. Okay. This is Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel. Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel, listening at 200 to 205. They seem to be fairly harmless at this point. They're uh, catching fish, wanting to trade fish. Uh, one approached the other day with uh, some fruit. I think they're just looking for fuel and trying to garner some supplies that they may not have a you know plentiful amount of and looking to, looking to barter at this point. We'll see how it goes. We'll watch them carefully for the next couple hours and through the night. Well, I, I think I, I got kind of scary because I'm, uh, I'm sitting here just alone, away from everything, and then suddenly you, you get fishermen. I, I didn't know whether they were fishermen or not. They just wanted to ask what is this and what is this, so I kind of thought that maybe they want to take something away. But eventually they turn, uh, they, they turn out to be a very friendly young people. But this, this happens so busy here. There's so many way it makes you feel a little, little comfortable too. But, uh, but anyway. Uh, that's uh, life here. Life is going on in the middle of the sea, even if there's nothing and nothing other than a uh, few rocks here. Kind of funny, isn't it? Okay, listening at 200, Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel. Bravo Sugar 7 Hotel, listening at 200.
Well, here we are on Rock 2. It's uh, almost 10 Zulu on uh, the 4th of May, 5th of May, 4th of May. I don't know what it is anymore. It's 10 Zulu. It's almost 6 p.m. local. The weather's beautiful. Uh, cooled off a little bit, I think. The humidity's down. Uh, the wind clocked around from the southeast, uh, which would have been a problem a few nights ago when the tide was much higher, but today the tide's low, and uh, I don't think we'll get any water on the platform. Pretty surprising tide range here. We uh, ran aground, I think, twice coming out to Rock 2, which is the easiest rock uh, to which to travel, so um, it's getting interesting. So I'm here on 20 meters. I'm on 14.024 uh, listening up. And uh, things are starting to roll. The sun is going to be down here in uh, not too long. And uh, that's when things uh, really start to rock. Uh, it's just beautiful sitting here listening to the generator and uh, the pileup. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to go diving. The, the, the pileups on this end, of course, were immense. I mean, the last operation had been cut short by politics, and so everybody wanted to get in the log. But some expeditions, you can wait until the pileups die down a day or two, so they're spread out, but not this time. No one knew if this was going to go past the yardstick of the last operation of 36 hours, so the, the bands were covered from top to bottom, panic calling, um, pileup behavior, um, furious, like uh, probably no entity I've ever seen. I mean, there have been new entities put on, but everybody said, I'll eventually get in the log. Here it was panic. Nobody had the guarantee that they were going to get in this log and the pileups showed it. Each morning brought in a whole new wave of email. And it got to the point that we finally had James put on the website a little interview by Sat Phone that it's just that hard. You have 16 operators sharing four tiny rocks, in some cases being out there from sunset to sunup with nothing on the horizon working down the pileups of panicked callers each day into the de-expedition for fear that this would end. We tried to explain to people that one guy sitting on a rock slightly bigger than a throw rug being sprayed by mist had certain dangers, but nobody wanted to hear that. Um, they wanted to know um, when the de-expedition was going to concentrate on other bands. Well, we said from the beginning, the purpose of this de-expedition was to give everybody a shot on 20 meters. 20 meters was open virtually everywhere in the world, but we still got emails saying at my daybreak when they should have been S9, they're only S3. Um, I couldn't break the pileup. Um, and so Tom and I would try to write back saying, there's five more days, there's four more days.
even the last Saturday that they were on the air, the emails were actually picking up in intensity as people were panicked that there would never be another de-expedition to Scarborough Reef, and this was their only shot. to make sure the logs are safe. So first thing we do is get the logging computer into a nice watertight, at least water proof bag. For the ride back. <laughs> there are many interesting entities on the list and I personally think that uh, this is one of the most exciting ones. There's a huge political challenge and you have to basically uh, have two countries to agree but being amateur radio operation, non-economical, non-political as it is, uh, we were able to convince both parties and have them actually involved. I don't think that any other activity over this sensitive area than amateur radio can facilitate these two parties. So actually, it's very emotional to see that these people let this type of operation to happen. We are here to witness uh, that uh, things can be done even over the disputed area. Bye bye, Rock 4. <laughs> bye bye, Rock 4. See you next time. For two years, people planned for this. Hams from various countries came together, not only the operators, but the people behind the scenes in the Philippines, in America, in Taiwan. People came together and got a group of intrepid hams to go sit all night on a rock with nothing around them and give you guys the cues against the odds of politics. There is no doubt that entities like Scarborough have pushed the limits of our own rules and tested the boundaries of what constitutes eligibility for the DXCC list. Indeed, the fact that we now use the term entity instead of just country is testament to Scarborough's profound impact on the world of DX. With a healthy 45,000 contacts in the log, some are now happy to see Scarborough stay on the list while others, even those who made a contact, still demand that it go. But regardless of anyone's position on this strange set of rocks, perhaps we could use more places like Scarborough Reef. Like it or not, it adds a little more excitement to our slowly fading hobby and a little more passion to our game.